New York and on the new Hot 97 app, Ebro in the Morning. On Hot 97. Ebro in the Morning, beautiful Laura Styles. You got Rosenberg yep. and Rory Lansman. He's yeah. a council member for the 24th District in New York City, but running for the District Attorney of Queens. Yes? Yes, sir. Now, uh, let's start with the simple one. What makes you qualified to be Queens District Attorney? Sure. So in the council, I chair the committee that oversees the district attorneys. And for the last five years, I have been on the leading edge of reforming the criminal justice system here in New York City, in directly attacking over-policing and mass incarceration of communities of color, the evils of cash bail, wrongful convictions, police misconduct, uh, the abuse of women. And there isn't a criminal justice reform issue that is being talked about in this race that I don't have a record on, either as... Uh, in terms of bills that I've passed, hearings that I've held, funding that I've appropriated. So you've been, you've been on the front lines of these I've conversations. I've been on the front lines, and all the things that we're talking about, I have, to a degree, already made happen. And the reason that I'm running for district attorney is because when you're the person sitting in the district attorney's big chair, you get to really, really affect criminal justice reform in an important, meaningful way. So I would assume that critics would say, because you've come from the political side of it, that you haven't come from the actual courtroom. No, side no, that of would it. be that would be a mistake. And okay. I, and so for 19 years, I was a practicing lawyer. I represented okay. uh, workers who had been discriminated against, or women who had been sexually harassed on the job in state and federal court. I represented people who had been cheated out of their wages. They weren't paid minimum wage. They weren't paid overtime. Um, I represented people who had been injured or, in some cases, killed on the job because their employers cut corners on on workplace safety. So I am a very experienced lawyer, and I bring that experience as a lawyer, my five years as a council member, and before that, six years as, as a state assembly member, so my public policy experience to the position of district attorney. And, and combined, I think that's what makes me the most qual qualified person. And you're from Queens? I'm from Queens. I grew up in Flushing with my mom in our little rent-regulated uh, apartment. My mom was a, a waitress. Um, she worked on tips, so sometimes... The tips were good, and sometimes they weren't. So we know uh, what it's like to be on public assistance. So we okay. knew what it was like to try for a landlord to try to harass us out of our apartment because he wanted to turn it into a, a co-op. Um, so I like to tell people I've I've lived the life, I've uh, talked the talk, and most importantly, I've walked the walk. That's dope. So that let's dope. let's jump to what we've been talking about um, a lot the last several days, um, the Chanel Lewis case mm -hmm. in Queens. Yeah. Um, so many people are paying attention right now to what's happening. Um, after the, the Ava DuVernay documentary about the Central Park Five. It's got people thinking. Ava DuVernay movie. Sorry, movie, not a documentary. That's right. Um, so it got us to talking about this Queens Jogger case again. It, 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 it seems fishy. The whole thing seems fishy. Would you be interested in reopening this case? Yeah, it's a very troubling case, as I said in a debate in, in, in New York One um, just this week. Um, it has all the echoes of another Central Park Five. In the council, I had a hearing on wrongful convictions. I think it was about two years ago. Um, and we had the mother of Youssef Salam come and testify. Talk about how things went down in that case. Well, the and use of Salam, that was the Esquire article you were reading on the air the other day. Right, right, right. He's one of the Central, Central Park Five. five. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's one of the Central Park Five. And, um, you know, people need to understand that wrongful convictions happen not just because you have a corrupt or a venal prosecutor or police officer. The whole system is built to coerce people into pleading guilty to crimes that they did not commit. Say that again for the people in the back. The whole system is built to coerce people into pleading guilty to crimes that they haven't committed, whether it's overcharging people in the first place or sending people to, to Rikers Island because they can't pay cash bail and they'll do anything to get off the island. Um, in the case of the Chanel Lewis, I've said it's very, very troubling. In, in the first instance, you had um, the police collect DNA samples from hundreds of black men who had absolutely nothing to do or no reason to, to think that anything right. to do Which is a drag with, with this case, this dragnet. And, and, and they're now in, in what is essentially a secret database that they can't get their, their DNA out of. Unbelievable. Mr. Lewis himself, someone obviously with learning disabilities, was kept up all night um, and interrogated. The first night he had spent away from his parents in his whole life, I understand. Wow. The videotape, uh, the, the, the interrogation was not videotaped, only the ultimate confession. Mm. And what you saw in the ultimate confession was a guy who obviously had a learning disability, obviously didn't even understand that the district attorney who was questioning him wasn't his own lawyer, and somehow had been led to believe in the course of the interrogation that was not videotaped that if he pled guilty, he would be eligible for some kind of program or something, which is absurd. 
So, and then you get to the trial itself, and I've read reports where the judge and court personnel wore um, uh, the color purple to identify with the victim's family who wore purple because it was Ms. Vitrano's famous color, mm -hmm. which is an absurd example of bias. And then most troubling, other than the confession, is that when the jury wanted to see the confession again during their de deliberations, they were told that the equipment wasn't working oh, and no. they should go back and deliberate. And then they went back and deliberated and ultimately found Mr. Lewis guilty without ever seeing And this that was after the mistrial. Convention. Right, this was in the second trial. It's the second right. trial. So all of those things um, are very, very troubling. And so would that be something that you would absolutely reopen if you were to get this job? It, it, would, something, it would be something that I would look at very closely. You know, in the council, I'm responsible for about a billion dollars of funding in the criminal justice arena. And uh, last year, or maybe it was two years ago, we went to the Staten Island District Attorney and the Queens District Attorney, who were the only two offices that didn't have something called a conviction review unit, where yep. people who were wrong heard about convicted could, could go and have their, their cases heard. And, and we said to both offices, we, if you set up a conviction review unit, we will fund it. And Staten Island said yes, and we funded them, I think it was almost half a million dollars to open up a conviction review unit. Queens did not. And what I say to folks in Queens is if your borough is behind Staten Island in criminal justice reform, you've, you've got trouble. a real problem. Yeah. You've got a real problem. So mm -hmm. um, it is something that my office will look at. Um, and, uh, and, why not make, and why not politically make a staunch commitment that you would, re that you would quote, unquote, reopen the case or review the case? Oh, I... I making that commitment. I will review this case, right. and I've okay. said this publicly, and, and I dare say that I've, of all the candidates who've running, I've been the, the, the most vocal about saying I will review this case, and, and I just went through some of the aspects of the case that, that I think are crying out for review. Now, the woman who is, the Queens DA now is whom? The Queens DA is, well, the district attorney was Richard Brown. He passed away passed about away. a month ago. So now it is an acting district attorney, a guy named Jack Ryan, who is the number two in the office, and he's been in the office for, I don't know, 30 years. Is he running for the office? He's not running for the office. How come? So, well, I, well, this office, this race, because of me, I flatter myself, since I was the first one to announce that I was running, is a referendum on the Queens District Attorney's office. It is a referendum on 28 years of um, a carceral punitive approach that has destroyed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people who have been arrested and, and, and given criminal records uh, for the rest of their lives for low-level offenses that make it hard for them to get a job, to get housing, to get education, in some cases even to vote what we call the new Jim Crow. Queens is ground zero for the mm. new Jim Crow in New York City. Mm. And that is what I'm running against. So I don't think that anyone who is in the office currently or, frankly, with respect to some of my other opponents who have spent a substantial time part of their career in the Queens District Attorney's Office is really eligible in the minds of the voters to be the ones to transform the Queens District Attorney's Office. The people who built this monstrous system, the prosecutors who, who built this system that I'm trying to tear down, are not the ones to rebuild it and shape it into something new. Um, you uh, talk openly about the justice system being broken. You want to fix it with people. What type of participation does the average voter need to be prepared for in fixing the things that you want to fix? The yes, citizens, because... Yeah, so pe that's, very, that's an excellent question. Um, people need to show up and vote on June 25th, but if you care about reforming the criminal justice system, you can't just show up, vote, and then hope for the best. You know, as a public official, as a council member, and before that as an assembly member, I have experience in bringing the community into the process of government. So when I'm district attorney, we're going to engage the communities throughout... Queens on how we should fix the criminal justice system and, and what their role in it can be. So, for example, um, I have the endorsement of the Rock Rockaway Youth Action Fund, which is a political arm of something called the Rockaway Youth Task Force. These are young people of color who are dedicated to um, building a more just community, including in the criminal justice arena, particularly as it relates to breaking the school-to-prison pipeline. I don't expect to be sitting in the DA's office issuing edicts on, on my own about how we're going to accomplish that. I have my own ideas, I have my own vision, but we're going to include people in that conversation. And uh, the clergy as well. I mean, I have the support of, of many of the, the most um, significant pastors in, in, in Queens. Um, Queens in the old days used to invite 
the clergy, to be part of the criminal justice system, to be able to, you know, maybe deal with a young person who went off the, the, mm -hmm. the track in a way outside of the criminal justice system. We lost that uh, a long time ago in Queens. I'm going to bring it back. So vote for me on June 25th, but then saddle up because... There's work to be done. There's work to be done. A um, couple of things we need to cover. You said you will not prosecute 16 and 17-year-olds as adults. That's all. That's top. right. You're I, not going to do that. That's right. I mean, I, I was one of the leading voices for the Raise the Age movement, right? New York had been one of the few states in the country that was still prosecuting 16, 17-year-olds as, adult, as adults. The legislature reformed that but it still gives prosecutors a lot of discretion, a lot and, of opportunity. And that's why people were unhappy with the bills, because it leaves too much discretion. It still leaves discretion for prosecutors to try to keep those cases in adult criminal court. I have said as district attorney, which all of which matches the work I've done as a council member and before that as an assembly member. None of this is new for me. As district attorney, we will treat every 16 and 17-year-old as a kid keep their cases in family court to the maximum extent that the law allows. Uh, doing your job, having three kids, you have a kid, you have a couple of kids that are three how old? Three kids. Three kids. 17, 19, and 21. Why would a human being uh, be able, be okay with, in, your, in a prosecutor's job, with treating a 16 and 17-year-old as an adult? Why would someone want to do that? It's a good well, question. It is a good question, and it, it's a good question because it, the answer to the question also describes much of why the criminal justice system is what it is. The criminal justice system um, almost exclusively applies to black and brown people, mm -hmm. and it is almost exclusively applied by white people. Mm -hmm. And white people see black and brown people as as other, mm -hmm. and, and, it, and studies have actually shown that when white people look at a uh, or ask the age of a of a of a black uh, child, they consistently overestimate that person's age. So mm -hmm. let's think a twelve year old is a fifteen year old, right? When that guy, when that cop rolled up on Tamir Rice and just jumped out of the car and shot that twelve year old boy dead, in his mind, he thought he was rolling up on like a seventeen or eighteen year old, and so and that's how deep the racial bias is. That is how deep the racial bias is. And so if you start from a proposition that you see black and brown people as the other and then you see young people as being older than they are, well, you look around and all you see are threats and danger. And, and, and it becomes acceptable to, to brutalize them and to dehumanize them in the way that our criminal justice system currently does. Um, and do you think that these ideas that you're putting out will be well received? Because... They yeah, they have been well received. Look, the, look, the public understands the urgent need for criminal justice reform, and I think it's particularly true in black and brown communities. Well, I guess when I say well received, well received by individuals did, that did not know that their brains were being wired this way. Well received by people in the police force who police this way. Well mm. received by right individuals who are right. feel like our criminal justice because. Those what people you're proposing are having trouble and, understanding what right, I'm saying. Yes. Right. And, and what you're talking about is um, realigning, restructuring, tearing down, however you want to say, revolutionizing, whatever word you want to use, mm -hmm. um, a system that a lot of people have faith in and kind of depend on their own um, bubble that they live in to feel safe, right? Because Central Park 5 happened because the elites... The people who live in bubbles heard something horrific happen. Teenagers were wilding out in the park, and something horrific happened. And within 48 hours, the police, who are funded by taxpayers and get donations from elites, they want to make sure a conviction or someone is held accountable for a horrific act. That's why these things happen, because they want to put a face with an act, and they want to do it fast, and when they want to do it fast, they pick on people who can't defend themselves. So let me give you a different example. Right? We were talking about, or at least I mentioned, over-policing and mass incarceration. There is a, a, a deeply seated belief among law enforcement, the police and the district attorneys, that black and brown people need to be monitored, need to be controlled. That's why stop and frisk existed, because there's a belief that mm. the, the police need to be in the lives and in the face of black people, brown people, in order to be able to maintain order. That's why broken windows 
was created and, and, and is sustained. That's why marijuana policing almost exclusively is applied against black and brown people. I have now two lawsuits against Mayor de Blasio and Commissioner O'Neill because they're not enforcing a law that I passed as it relates to the racism that exists in mm. how fair, inv- fair evasion is enforced. And fair it, evasion, fair jump, evasion. A jump, jump a turnstile, okay. right? It's almost exclusively applied to black or brown people. Something like 85, 86% of mm. people who are arrested are black or brown, which, which is even less than marijuana, which is something like 92%. Right. And the reason I have two lawsuits against Mayor de Blasio and Commissioner O'Neill, I believe, is because they cannot shake themselves of the um, uh, insistence and need to try to scoop up and have the police put their hands on as many black and brown people as possible to maintain order, to maintain control, and to find the ones that are engaged in wrongdoing. It is it is the deep-seated um, foundation and belief of our criminal justice system that our black nation. and brown people... Our, our nation. nation. Our nation, but our criminal justice system in particular is what, yeah. what I'm running to change. Um, that black and brown people need to be controlled and monitored. And I am trying to break that in Queens. Where do you stand on uh, on cash bail? Because I know I read that you recently got into it with Melinda Katz. First, she's the one that, for the most part, everybody's like kind of flaming. Yeah. So you know, I've known Melinda a long time. We're friends, but she has no interest in criminal justice reform or the criminal justice system. I right. mean, from voting for the death penalty twice when she was in the state assembly to not sponsoring any criminal justice reform bills when she was a council member as borough president. She gave four state of the borough addresses as borough president before she was running for district attorney. Not one mentioned anything to do with criminal justice reform. So um, we've gone back and forth because I have long opposed the use of cash bail ever. Right. A few miles from this studio on Rikers Island, thousands of people are sitting in jail awaiting their day in court. They haven't been convicted mm-hmm. of anything. And most of them could walk out the door tomorrow if only they had the money to pay cash bail. They are literally in jail because they're, they're poor. And that's my position. We, as district attorney, will not ask for cash bail in any case. Now, I know that we're capable of doing that. Because in the council, I have overseen the expansion of supervised release programs and of other programs and mechanisms for ensuring that people return to court without using cash bail um, as, as a means to do that. And, and, you know, there are other candidates in this race who have no background with reforming the criminal justice system. They may have stories to tell from their, their, their careers and the positions that they've held that they want to say will suggest that when they are DA, they'll do this or that. But I'm really the only one who's done all of these things. Some of them have done some things, but I've only done all of those things. And in the case of the borough president, um, she's just been all over the place on the issue of of cash bail and and really doesn't support. Do you ever call her privately or text her privately and go, yo, what the F are you talking about? (laughs) No, I don't do that. You should do it. Send her a text right now. But if people do support cash bail, it's, I assume it's because there are people who are benefiting off that that of course. want to continue to benefit. Right? The reason that people support cash bail is because we use cash, we use money as a way to keep people in jail who we're afraid of. Right? We're one of only a handful of states in the country that doesn't let judges assess whether an individual is actually a danger to someone. But New York State is so progressive and liberal and stuff. But like, shouldn't it be straightforward, right? Like, for example, you walk up on, an, uh, on a guy beating up a, an old lady, right? And <laughs> I understand why that guy, you're like, you know what? You're not, you're, you're not walking out of jail tonight because you fell out papers. We caught you mid-violent act. Right. We saw you on tape doing it. saw it on tape. It's, even though there hasn't been a conviction yet, we know you're a danger. But there's... Versus you stole a backpack. Right. You st- allegedly. You, st- you, stole, you allegedly stole a backpack. What's the point of that person being stuck behind bars while waiting trial? Does it make sense? Yeah, and, and and what we do is if the judge feels like a person is a danger to society or they feel like the process is going to be the punishment. At the end of the day, this person is going to take a plea of guilty, so we need to punish them up front. I'm going to set cash bail on amount that I don't think that person can pay. They go off to Rikers for a certain period of time, and that'll be, quote-unquote, the case. Very few cases, very few cases actually get tried before a jury 
and, a, and, a, and there's a verdict of guilty or not guilty. Like law and order, that, that isn't the criminal justice system. The criminal <laughs> justice system is the arraignment part on Queens Boulevard. But law and order is a documentary. <laughs> no, it's a TV show. Not oh, a documentary. Sorry. I love it, but, you know. The law is very And into all it. you will see in that court as people are brought in and charged with offenses is black and brown face after black and brown face for nonsense. And almost all of those cases will result in some kind of uh, plea bargaining. Very few will actually go to a trial. And, and, it, and the phrase that I used, the process is the punishment, really describes the criminal justice system. And do you ba back the plan to close Rikers Island? I do back the plan to close Rikers Island, and I'm the only candidate in this race who backs that full plan. Not just to close Rikers Island, which must be closed. Cause well, Caban said she backs it, too. No, no. Well, let me tell you the difference, and it's very important, okay. right? Because it's not enough to say you're going to close Rikers Island, as I do, and, and I think all the other candidates do in some way, shape, or form. But the second part of the plan is where are the people who are going to remain incarcerated while they're awaiting trial or because they're doing a sentence of less than a, a year or they're waiting to go upstate? Where are they going to go? And I'm the only candidate who's willing to say that I support the full plan, which includes opening up four borough-based jails, including one in Queens, in Kew Gardens, 150 feet from my council district, which will be built to humane standards and will allow people who are incarcerated to be close to their families, now, to be close to their lawyers, to be close to court. If you're not willing to say where you're going to house people who, who will still so be detained... So the full solution after, is what you're then, saying. Then you're not serious about criminal justice reform. You're afraid to alienate people in that neighborhood. Yeah. And if you're afraid to alienate people in that neighborhood now... You're not going to have the courage to do real criminal justice So let's justice talk reform. numbers, yes. right? How many people are on Rikers right now? It's about 7,500. 7,500, right, Which okay. is down from slightly less than 10,000 when I got started Some people council. believe if you build more jails, you're building more inventory. That's absolute nonsense, okay? At the end of closing Rikers, there will still be people who are going to be incarcerated. All the work that we've done to lower the population of Rikers Island and the work that I'm going to continue to do as DA to further lower it, we're not going to get to zero. Right? And so people, there needs to be a place where people are going to be incarcerated. Well, I guess what people are saying is, is if there's 7,500 people on Rikers and they go out and build 20,000 jails. They're not building 20,000 jails. Hold on. How much space are no, no, when no. these four, how, how, how much space are we talking about? Five? Yeah. Well, no, it's four because the, the mayor chickened out on Staten Island. Oh. oh. We could do a show on Mayor de Blasio and his unwillingness to do criminal justice reform. That's We should. We should be happy to come back after yeah, we the should. DA and we talk should. about that. Um, but the original plan was to build the jail, four jails that equaled about 5,500, 6,000 uh, beds. The, the Queens jail was going to be, I think, 1,550. Okay. But it's already been reduced um, just so, for the last but couple But there weeks. is conversation. My point is about managing, and I'm using the word inventory yeah. because money is made on this no, shit. No, without, without question, the jails that are proposed are a much lower capacity okay. than the capacity of Rikers Island. There was a time when we had 20,000 people on Rikers Island. Yeah, I heard, yeah right? it was just so, overrun. So we're not, we're not building new jails, which we're then going to fill and increase the jail population. The jails that are going to be built are much smaller in total than the current inventory. To and you use know, your but you, and I can tell uh, from your time working that you know as voters, we just don't trust always that these promises are going to be kept. Or that these things are, or how to even hold people accountable. Right. Like that's the part. That's the part. No, as I get it. Nor, nor should you. So, for example, <laughs> if we were building four jails that could hold twenty thousand people, I'd be worried. You'd have every right to be worried. Right. But these are not jails that can hold that capacity. They're only they're jails that can hold a much lower number of people than we are currently incarcerating. Are you? Uh, and before we get out of here, are you aware of what's happening in the city with city bikes and joyriding and kids joyriding them? Other than that's something that kids do, but what do you mean in particular? Well, I'm being told, and it's not being written about. We've talked about it on the air. It's a felony if you get caught riding because they, the, the, they say the bikes are twelve hundred dollars. Because city bike prices ah, the bikes at twelve hundred dollars. Okay, yes. Well, that's just an example of the way that we overcharge people throughout the criminal justice system. I mean, you had alluded to the case of Khalif Browder right. when you were talking about a kid uh, the stealing a backpack, right? He was charged with robbery to a C felony, a 16-year-old allegedly stealing a backpack, backpack off another person. We overcharge people relentlessly across the New York City. How does something like this get fixed? Well, it gets fixed... Because this summer, <laughs> kids are going to be... And you get a felony right. for joyriding a bike right. in your neighborhood? Yeah. So it gets fixed in part by having a district attorney who has the experience and the will to say to the police department, do not bring me these cases 
because we are not going to charge them as felonies. So like when Cy Vance, the Manhattan District Attorney, at our urging, told the police department, we are not prosecuting fare evasion arrests in Manhattan, fare evasion arrests in Manhattan plummeted. When we exposed the racism in marijuana policing, particularly in Southeast Queens, we forced the mayor to adopt a new policy that has resulted in thousands fewer people being arrested for marijuana policing. But imagine if you had a district attorney, as I would be, who would go all, all out and tell the mayor and the police commissioner, I'm not prosecuting people for these low-level offenses. Well, then the police can't arrest them. As I like to say, the police can only police what prosecutors are willing to prosecute. Uh, his name is Rory Lansman. Good stuff. He is uh, running for Queens District Attorney. It was a pleasure speaking to you, man. Good luck. Thank you. It was a pleasure uh, We've being here. We've had some great conversations. Who have we had? We had Caban. Matt and Malik. Uh, Malik and yourself so far. How many are there total in the race? There's there's seven of us total. Well, seven of hopefully us total. we're done interviewing you guys now. <laughs> You don't want to interview anymore. No, Marvel? this was really good. That, but now three is enough. We got to eat all I feel like seven. I feel like this this should be enough. This wraps it up. He agrees. Doing a favor, you and, and your listeners, please keep uh, Gwen Carr in your prayers. We are waiting for a verdict in the case of uh, Eric Garner, uh, her son who was killed. Um, Gwen has been a big supporter of mine. Um, I was there the first day of that that trial, and uh, that woman is a profile. And courage, and, and we all. She needs all our prayers. And, and do you think Officer Panaleo should have a job? Oh, he should have been fired a long time ago. It's an outrage that he is still. It's on embarrassing. The force. It, it's we should a, be ashamed of ourselves. It's a disgrace. Um, and during the time that he was actually on the force, there was a period where he was actually getting overtime and yeah. making more money yeah. than when before he killed Eric Garner. Wow, disgusting. It's crazy. Thank Rory Lansman, give it up one time. Thank, Thank you for your time Thank today. You.